morning, everybody, and welcome to this morning's talk. Um, my name is Roy Kareem, and I'm delighted to be your host for this morning. Um, I am a brown man and with short hair and a black t-shirt on, and that's for the sake of an audio description. Um, and I also say I'm rather warm this morning due to our current heat wave. Um, so I'm going to be your host for the whole morning, taking us all the way through to up to almost 12 o'clock. Um, and I am part of the Watershed's Future Is Collective program, which is a program supported by Arts Council England and also partially funded by Bis Bristol and Bath Creative R&D. Um, this morning's Imagining Possibilities talk um, is going to be an incredible showcase for creative people working to solve the climate challenge. A captioned version of this talk will be available on YouTube shortly after the live event. We also really encourage questions from the audience um, and you can do that via the YouTube chat, but the key bit is you need to be logged into your YouTube slash Google account to be able to type questions into the chat. So if you've just got the live stream up, that's great, but you actually need to be logged into YouTube to be able to post questions into the chat. And we'll be constantly keeping an eye on that and then be able to feed via me and back to our presenters this morning. So please do put any comments, thoughts, questions in the chat and hopefully we'll get to as many as possible. Um, so we're gonna go straight into our first talk and our first talk this morning um, is by Zoe Resbash. Um, she is a writer, programmer, action researcher working at Bristol and Bath Creative R&D and the Watershed and she's been exploring the role of the creative industries in a just transition and cre cre um, came up with an amazing creative climate action toolkit, which I'll be sharing in the chat for you guys to have a look at as well. Um, unfortunately, Zoe wasn't able to be here live this morning, so she did a pre-recorded version of her talk. So for this one only, um, we won't be doing a Q&A because she's not, she's not here to answer any of your questions, but for all the rest of the talks, please do feed your questions into the YouTube chat. Um, so without further ado, um, here is Zoe with her talk on about beginning your climate action journey. Hi, my name is Zoe Rasbash and I'm an action researcher at Bristol and Bath Creative R&D and Watershed. Um, and for, as part of my research over the last year and a half, I've been thinking about how the creative sector in the Southwest can become more sustainable. Um, part of this has been kind of mapping the, the variety of needs of, of uh, different people, organizations, places across the sector and figuring out how we can support people to basically make change for good, to be more sustainable, be more regenerative um, within their creative practice. Um, yeah, and so part of this journey has been working with the wonderful creative, uh, creative technology residents um, in the pervasive media studio and realizing that there's a real gap uh, in addressing the needs of, of freelance creatives. We have lots and lots of resources from Julie's Bicycle, from Arts Council England, from Creative Carbon Scotland for like, larger creative institutions. But um, freelance creatives, there's a, a very, very specific, uh, unique barriers to climate action. Um, and I was speaking to loads of people and, um, you know, with such a breadth of kind of creativity, um, breadth of skills, and everyone kind of wants to do their bit to act, be better and be more sustainable, but it can be super overwhelming. And actually a lot of people felt like, well, as a small organization or creative freelancer, the, the changes that they would make would be so small um, that it wouldn't make much difference anyway. And I completely see how people think like that. And, I, and there is an element of this is true, whereas to address climate change, we need systems change. We need large organizations to change. Um, uh, and we need, um, yeah, top down change. Uh, but we also need creative people to be experimenting with new ways of doing things from the bottom up on a local scale. And I feel like there's such potential um, with kind of uh, freelance creatives, small creative organizations and businesses to kind of enact change now. Um, particularly because the creative industry has a really unique role in tackling climate change. Often the smaller you are, the more unique and special your relationship with your audiences and customers and partners are. Um, often uh, what makes it kind of 
creative spaces different to kind of like campaign spaces or policy spaces on climate change is that we can really make space for like nuanced discussion um, holding climate action together with inclusion well-being platforming marginalized voices bringing people into the conversation thinking about how to program or speak to um, the communities or customers or partners that we work with every day um, and these relationships are so important for telling the story of climate change in millions and millions of different ways that which resonates and inspires people. And, and also, as I was having these conversations, I was really realizing that small is, is beautiful and essential. And we can't just have these kind of big changes. We also need, yeah, as I was saying before, um, bottom up changes. There's a real ability and, and dynamism and flexibility of smaller creative businesses and freelancers um, to kind of try new things out. Um, testing and reflecting as you go, like trying new practices, figuring out new ways of um, buying more locally, et cetera, um, which like larger creative businesses can't do as quickly due to just like large staff sizes, processes of making decisions like boards and exec groups that all must be consulted. Whereas like freelancers are, are, are well placed to kind of like, the only person you kind of have to change is you. So you can really figure out what works and what doesn't work in a, in a time scale that we kind of need in climate action, which is a lot, lot quicker. And these things can be scaled up or adapted um, to build new pathways for action. So there's like a real potential here um, for kind of, yeah, freelancers to really make um, an impact in, in kind of the creative climate space. Um, it's really important that we think about how we're going to make our practices more sustainable um, as we go into the future and, and, and recognize that the arts are a, a massive part of our society um, and therefore have a responsibility to, to become more sustainable and, and do their part. But as a freelance creative, I completely understand that it sometimes feels like you don't have any power necessarily when you're going into new spaces of work because you know the way the, the natural way they're working is project to project working with new teams partners and people all the time sometimes it's like i can't go into that space and tell people how to run their show differently and because the creative sector is so interdependent it, this can definitely feel like a barrier um with the matrix of kind of like partners collaborators funders making individual action feel impossible um uh, and um also there's the element of kind of to kind of change how we do things. We need time, we need capacity, and we need money. Um, and where large organizations, large creative organizations, have kind of regular funding and they have like a linear, linear trajectory of action, freelancers um, funding changes all the time. So it's much harder to plan year to year to have like a sort of yearly climate plan. Um, and because there's all the guides, most of the guides that exist are kind of for larger creative organizations assume this kind of linear pathway of action. There's a real need to think about like ways we can do things more flexibly, how we can change things, how um, things might develop in a kind of uh, less linear way. And kind of as again, I was having these conversations with people, I was like, part of the problem, I think, is also that we have a very um, narrow definition of what we think of as climate action. Um, you know, thinking about things like solar panels and recycling. And yes, these are super important and really, really brilliant, but not necessarily the most relevant to like what, where freelance creatives can affect change. And I think it's sometimes really useful to broaden out how we define climate action by considering where we as individuals or you guys as um, uh, freelance creatives have capacity, resource and power to affect change within your practice and the, and the kind of, uh, circles that you work in often that's not going to be getting solar panels on a building because that's just not where your power capacity and resources lie but that does not mean that you don't have power capacity and resource to affect change so let me just share my screen for a moment and introduce something that i've been calling the um uh creative climate action venn diagram so i think it's really useful to like break down and broaden out what we think of as climate action away from just kind of like solar panels and stuff so what i've got here in this kind of right circles right gender my left and right um is tangible reduction so those things that i was talking about those activities which tangibly reduce or remove emitting or polluting activities so we're talking about here like buying less and buying local reusing materials um plain free, free touring changing to a new renewable, renewable energy supplier all really really important stuff but a massive facet of where creatives can affect change is through collective transformation, through storytelling. And so that's this kind of top one up here. So talking about in a highly interdependent sector, working with or influencing collective change with relevant networks, partners, audiences, and customers. And that's kind of what I was talking about earlier, like these relationships we have with the communities and the people that we work with, what stories are we telling? 
how is that affecting collective change in society? There really is a role that we all must play. Um, so that's talking about everything from, you know, like programming a film festival or, you know, um, creating a new film about a uh, platform and kind of a, a new story or a marginalized voice or a local community, you know, doing the work on climate change. Um, but also down to kind of knowledge sharing, um, speaking with people, um, how are you doing things differently? Is there things that I can learn from that? Having conversations as you go into a new uh, workplace and a new project, like are you raising kind of sustainability at the beginning of that to kind of ask what can we do with the power, capacity and resources we have at the beginning of this kind of partnership um, to make it as sustainable as possible? And like maybe that will come to nothing, but I think sometimes just having that conversation at the beginning of kind of starting work together can establish a basis um, of action and and that's super important as well and um the last kind of circle i put here is action enablers so these are activities which don't have tangible reductions right now but enable you to make kind of better decisions uh, try and test more sustainable ways of working learn and, and make those emissions reductions in ways that work for you down the line so these are things that don't like tangibly like have you know a positive environmental impact right now but create the foundation to do those things in the long term. And these are still fundamental parts of building a more sustainable society. So things that are like, include like researching decisions, um, raising funds if you can to do things differently, G going to training, um, having conversations with people, all of these things which are kind of intangible, but support you to develop and understand your practice better and how it can be done more sustainably. And, and we, I don't think because we're so driven by productivity in our society. We kind of think that like, until we get those emissions reductions, it doesn't count as action. We can't take it off the list. And that's not true. We have to be kinder to ourselves and realize sometimes we'll research about doing something in a different way and it will come to nothing. But that's still really important that we did that and we eliminate that. So it's about thinking about climate action in a much broader sense and being kind to ourselves and realizing that um, things as, as small as, as just Googling stuff and, and having a conversation with trusted partners about how they're doing things is, is still really fundamental part of climate action. Um, so some examples of, of action enablers uh, um, might be yeah, research, fundraising, training, having conversations and knowledge sharing. Um, and like testing, trying new ways of like doing your practice differently. Um, yeah, so that's kind of uh, just an example of how we can kind of broaden out what we think of as climate action to be more relevant to uh, what us as freelancers, um, creatives can do, um, or what we have the power to change. Um, and so I've been thinking about kind of this and the needs of, of, of freelancers and, and thinking about, okay, um, freelance creatives have really diverse needs as well. The creative sector encompasses such a broad range of activity that we can't really have uh, a one size fits all. Like this is what you need to do to be more sustainable. It just doesn't work like that because everybody's work values practices um, where they work is so, so different. Everyone has unique needs, um, uh, which can make it really hard to navigate like traditional climate action resources because it's like cherry picking which bits might be useful for you. And as I was kind of having all these conversations, with all these different freelancers, I was realizing it's not about give, telling people exactly what to do. It's about figuring out a process where people can, can figure it out for themselves. You are the expert in what you do. I will never be know what you do better than you do. So is there a process that we can go through um, that's easy where we can provide questions where people can kind of figure out what they can do themselves? And, and part of this is realizing that it's about prioritizing because we can get totally overwhelmed by all the potential possible things that we could do to tackle climate change, like even in our own individual lives, right? Like you can like walk everywhere, you can become a vegan, you can stop driving, like there's lots of things, like stop buying, stop flying, and like that can just feel like, whoa, I don't even know where to start, I'm feeling completely overwhelmed. You can't do everything at once, and that's the same for your, your practice, your creative practice as well. Um, and, and that can lead to kind of burnout, feeling overwhelmed, feeling apathetic. So it's all about mapping potentially what you could do and figuring out what to take forward because it's always better to do a few things well than get completely overwhelmed and burn out trying to do loads and this kind of idea of okay prioritizing figuring out what works for you through a process um, is what led me to create uh, the climate action toolkit 
So I'm just going to share um, that with you now. Um, so I created this uh, Creative Climate Action Toolkit out of um, the a process of, of workshops and conversations with lots of different creative freelancers. Um, it's hosted on the Bristol and Bath Creative R&D website for everyone to use. Uh, it includes a video um, where I could talk a lot about what I'm talking about right now. But if you skip to the end, you can get to some guided exercises. These guided exercises are based off these workshops that I, I did with lots of different people. Um, uh, and this, it helps basically, uh, you kind of map all the different things that you do in your job that potentially have negative environmental impact um, and figure out, okay, what do you has, have the power to change? What would you like to change, but you have some needs that need to be met? Uh, <coughs> and how can you then prior take that forward and prioritize what actually your capacity, resource and power to change now? Um, this includes a worksheet, which I'll just show right now. Um, which kind of goes through the several steps of the exercises. So here you kind of map all the different things that you can protect that are potentially negative environmental impact. Here you start thinking about what are the solutions, what are the blockages, what are the questions, what are the unknowns. Uh, you kind of pull that information here uh, and um, think about how you can kind of categorize this into potentially short, medium and long-term goals. So what you already are doing, what you can do, have the power to change, what you, you can do but might need some help, funding or resources. Um, and lastly, uh, prioritizing. So defining your own timescales of action and, and taking things forward. That might sound a little bit difficult to do, but I promise the guided exercises take you through um, uh, it, it in more detail. And if you feel like, I don't know any of that, like I don't know how any of that would apply to me, um, the last kind of resource as part of this toolkit is, is a checklist. Uh, this checklist is... Um, uh, it has sort of six action areas, um, buildings and energy, travel, finance, digital footprint, procurement materials and waste, and audience customers and networks. In each section, it has a sort of, uh, let me skip, it has an, uh, a little introduction about kind of the impact and what we're talking about when we say buildings and energy when it comes to climate action. And then it has uh, a list of, of sort of crowdsourced actions from different freelance creatives of things that they're able to do um, uh, in these different areas. The idea is no one can do all of these things at once, but hopefully if you go through the checklist, you can find things that might apply to you in your practice, that might apply um, to your needs and what you have the power to change. None of us can do all of this at once, but the idea is you kind of take things that might be relevant to you um, and potentially adapt them to meet your needs. Um, they're all geared towards small creative businesses and creative freelancers. Um, and uh, um, yeah, the idea is just taking a few things forward. It also provides uh, at the end of each section tools and resources that can kind of support taking those actions forward either for more information or literal tools that you can use again all aimed at um, supporting smaller creative businesses and creative freelancers uh, the idea isn't that you do tons of stuff it's about mapping where you potentially can do lots of different things and then taking a few things forward that you can do um, i'll stop sharing now so I'll get hopefully Chi to share that link to that toolkit in the in the chat. Um, but I would love for you guys to try it out, give it a go, um, and let me know what you think. I think the most important message when it comes to being a freelancer and thinking about climate action is realizing it can't, we can't do everything at once. We need systems change. We need industry change to become more sustainable. But we are a part of that industry and something as small as having a conversation on a new project or a partner to establish sustainability as, as a value um, is a small shift towards pushing our industries to be more um, sustainable, to be more ethical, to be more conscious. And as you test these actions out in the toolkit, you will have learnings and reflections that will be useful for other people as well. And through trying and testing and learning, this is how we'll be able to build up more actions, more practices um, to shift larger change overall. 
I hope this all makes sense and this all helps. I'm sorry I can't be there with you today, um, but I would love to chat to anyone who has any questions or thoughts or um, feedback or doubts or concerns. So you can reach me at zoe.r at watershed.co.uk and I'd be happy to chat anytime. Um, good luck and enjoy the rest of the event. Uh, thanks so much. everyone thank you so much to zoe for that fantastic talk um and just a quick note we have two amazing bsl interpreters uh who will be uh, live interpreting all these talks this morning but we had a little technical difficulty on that first one where they weren't able to hear the audio so apologies we didn't have interpretation for that one but um our, our two amazing interpreters will be here for the rest of the morning um and as I said, uh, this is that first talk was pre-recorded, so we're not going to do a Q&A because Zoe sadly is not able to be with us this morning. But from now on in is the time that you can be asking questions in the YouTube chat. And remember, remember, you can only do that if you're logged into YouTube so via your Google account or whatever. Log yourself in to the YouTube live stream and you can type your questions into the chat for all of our amazing speakers this morning. Um, so without further ado, let's um, crack on. Oh, one thing um, I did put in the YouTube chat, which is that Creative Climate Toolkit that Zoe was talking about. Um, you can access it uh, via that um, link that I put into the YouTube chat. So please do go and check that out. But without further ado, let us move to our second speaker this morning, who is Tai Aziz. Tai Aziz is a filmmaker and science communicator based in Bristol, who's worked across productions for Netflix, the BBC and independent companies with a range of local and international teams. And she's going to be talking about sourcing greenly. So Tai, if I can hand over to you and thank you very much for being with us this morning. Thank you so much, Roy. So, hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Ty. I'm a brown woman and I'm wearing a gold shirt. Um, sorry, Roy, actually, I decided to change the topic of my talk quite last minute. So, ignore what it says online. I'm not going to be talking about sourcing, but I'm actually going to be sharing um, my work as a community filmmaker. Um, and we'll be discussing my work as a community organiser and how I bring that community organising into my storytelling practice. Um, I have some photos that I can share as well. So as a community organiser, a lot of my films have involved bringing these strands together. I love to work closely with communities and people around Bristol and further afield to drive that practice. So some things that I'll be sharing today are kind of learnings from previous films I've worked on. And if this is something that you're interested in, if you're interested in working closely together with communities to kind of drive your storytelling, especially in the light of the climate crisis and um, producing environmentally diverse content, then I hope that this can be this could be useful and you can take some things away from it. So the reason that I kind of started taking this practice forward was in the climate, in the climate crisis, stories is one of the most powerful tools we have. Stories help us change the way we view our lives and how we dream about the future, but also lets us dream about who is involved in the future that we create in our imagination. So, you know, these talks are very aptly named imagining possibilities for a more environmentally just future for humans and wildlife that includes everyone no matter where you're from what kind of background you have and we've been told a certain story we've had a certain line of thinking that got us into this current ecological and climate crisis in the first place and that is a story of infinite material growth on a finite planet. So that's one example of a story that we've been told. And I believe we need a completely different story to get us out of that. Um, to build those stories, we need as many different people with many different cultural and 
lived experiences, many different backgrounds, all bringing together their shared wisdom and knowledge and culture to tackle this problem together. So I think it's never been more important to make sure everyone can see themselves on screen and that people can tell their own story. And community filmmaking is a really powerful tool because it allows those groups that haven't been given enough of a voice in the film industry, it gives them a way to potentially make their own work, but also to engage with people like filmmakers um, and kind of shift that power dynamic that's kind of at the heart of the issue, giving them the spotlight to produce films with a social purpose and tell new and important perspectives. So as a filmmaker, that's one of the key issues to remember is that we have a lot of power, power to define how the images we create and also the subjects we portray are depicted to the world. And we also need to remember that these images will continue to live on um, long after the projects are over and even long after ourselves and our subjects are around. So if I kind of share a little bit of Rooted in Bristol, this is a film that I produced as part of Africa Art Film Festival and the Watershed kindly screened it as part of the festival. We were really keen to tell an untold story of the Black and Afro-Caribbean community in Bristol who were really instrumental in saving many allotment sites around Bristol from development. And this was a story that had never been told before. And the way that community organizing came into this was actually through working closely with that community long before the film idea had ever been dreamt up and the film kind of evolved organically. And that's one of the really powerful tools about using a community organizing approach in filmmaking is that you build those kind of connections with your contributors first and the storytelling will organically follow when you have those really authentic relationships. So as I mentioned in Rooted in Bristol, we wanted to tell this untold story of the role that the Black and Afro-Caribbean diaspora played in saving allotment sites. And as part of community filmmaking, it's not only just the relationships that you build, but again, going back to how you portray your subjects is really important as well. So just to kind of touch on the technical side of things a little bit, we kind of tried to make all of our subjects really feel like they were part of the landscape in the way that we filmed. So we really wanted to show and fight those stereotypes that, you know, Black and Afro-Caribbean people don't spend time outside. They don't take part in nature. I really wanted to fight those stereotypes. So a lot of the images were, a lot of the way we filmed was kind of beautiful wide landscapes with people featuring as a prominent part of them. And a lot of the way that I shot the film was making sure Black people felt not only part of the landscape, like they were woven into the thread of the land that they were working on, but also to portray them as custodians of the land. So you kind of get this sense that they are really there, they are part of this landscape. Um, and I also wanted to feel, I, want, I wanted the viewer to feel like they were kind of part of the soil and close to the soil, which is why we have a lot of these kind of lower angles really showing the people that we filmed as those caretakers and custodians. So that's a really important project that I, I feel really proud of. I think it really helped us to kind of spotlight, as I mentioned, new stories from diverse communities and work with organisations and individuals, but as well as spotlighting their story it also helped us bring different groups of people together to enact change and that's something that as a filmmaker is a really powerful tool in in that kind of community organizing approach it allows us to amplify and different solutions which can lead to environmentally 
just solutions for everyone and to bring people together into a conversation that may not be able to meet otherwise. I think it's a very personal decision to create a film and send it out into the world. You know, once it meet, once that film meets an audience, a film kind of has an entire life out of the hands of the people that made it. So it kind of gives us as filmmakers a very unique sense of responsibility in who you are choosing to portray. Um, it's really important to understand how and why you want to film something or someone, but it's equally I think to ask yourself why does your subject want to be filmed how does their motivation change over time what's the kind of story they want to tell so it's it's quite a different it's quite a different perspective and a different way to create films because the storytelling and the stories come after those relationships are built but as I mentioned it helps you to sort of build those stories organically um, so with Rooted in Bristol, for example, as we mentioned, we wanted to spotlight the role this community in Bristol played in saving allotment sites. And because we had built those relationships, all these kind of incredible themes emerged very organically. So that meant having lots of conversations about land sovereignty, about food security, about feeling belonging within the UK and kind of themes of identity and all these really deep, incredible subjects that emerged organically through conversations and relationships that we built. We met these contributors far before filming commenced and we put a lot of time to kind of build those deep relationships. It meant going to allotment sites in person just to meet people and kind of tracking people down. A lot of the communities that we filmed didn't have smartphones or even also a lot of it was done through word of mouth and you know people saying oh you need to go and speak to so-and-so because they've done this amazing work for so long and yeah and really building those organic relationships and it got to the point as I mentioned where community members would approach us for stories and then production was kind of organically developed and engagement with that community still happens today so you know the film was released last year in November and we still have people from the allotment reaching out to us and saying we've seen Rude in Bristol we want to be part of it you need to come and film our plot and yeah it's a uh, I think when you produce films for community the community becomes your contributors as well as your audience and it can be incredibly empowering to have a story that is so interwoven in someone's kind of group and the way they see themselves as individuals um because I think they felt a real sense of ownership over the film and that was very special to us. Um, of course, you're not going to be able to make connections or have those open conversations or make change if you're just trying to get things out of people. So a lot of the way we kind of structure the work that we do is um, by looking at resources. There are so many resources for community organizing online, so it'd be impossible to cover everything. But just to give a kind of starting point, this is a framework which has been developed by the community organizers, organization, bit of a mouthful. Um, but it's it's incredibly helpful as a kind of starting point, and it really helps drive a lot of our decisions. So we have things like reach, which makes is kind of touching on again, making sure we speak to communities that haven't had their stories told before. Listening is a really important skill, making sure we are honest and authentic about what we want to get out of the production from the start so that everything is transparent as possible and we can build those relationships with communities from a completely honest perspective from the start. Um, again, going back to Root in Bristol, Connect is a big part of this, so as I mentioned, we built some amazing relationships between the communities that we worked with on the council after the film was produced so filmmaking really has that power to drive change and drive new relationships through that storytelling to reach different organizations who may be able to help in that change within those communities um and of course kind of leadership 
is part of that as well. So through your filmmaking, you may identify contributors who are really amazing on camera, but also really amazing within their community. And I think filmmaking is a really powerful tool to identify those kind of natural leaders, people that can enact change for their communities um, and help drive climate justice and environmental movements um, and then further inspire the communities around them. So yeah, definitely worth thinking about who you can spotlight and how you can empower them to represent their communities. It's not about it's not about us as a filmmaker kind of choosing who we want to feature and what story we want to tell, but that should come organically from the community itself and they should really feel ownership over that decision and that process. Um, so I think that's roughly everything I have to share today. I hope there's quite a broad overview of the process. It's um, It can vary so much between productions, but I hope that kind of gives you a flavour of what the power of community storytelling can be and how rewarding it can be to help uh, drive those really new perspectives and stories when you work really closely with communities like this. So thank you. Hi, thank you so much. That was brilliant. I love the images. Um, I've got so many questions, uh, but we're super pushed for time. And so I just wanted to ask you one thing, which is um, about the Bristol Rude film itself. Is it, can people go and watch it? Is it publicly available? And if so, how do, how do people do that? How do people connect with the film at the moment? So the film is still kind of making its way around the festival circuit, but I know that Africa Eye Film Festival are really keen to get it out to the public soon. So it should be going on their website at some point. And I will make sure we share when that happens because yeah, it's been long awaited <laughs> to hit the public. Ah, oh, amazing. Ty, thank you so much uh, for contributing this morning. Um, that was brilliant. Um, and yes, please do look up uh, Ty's amazing work and we'll be sharing all the details and keep an eye out for Bristol Rooted. Um, all right, we're gonna keep things moving, go straight on to our next talk this morning, um, which is with Ludovica Chiarini. Um, she has been working as a sustainability manager on film sets and researching sustainable production practices, working directly to support producers. She is currently housed at EcoMovie, where she's responsible for sustainability policy strategy and implementation across all their projects of um, their environmental policies. And her talk is all around very aptly, sustainability managers are the future. Ludovica, can I hand over to you? Yes, of course. Hello, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us. Uh, I am a, first of all, Caucasian curly woman with a polka dotted shirt and of course sweatpants because we know that Zoom only requires the top of us, right? Um, yes, thank you for this uh, presentation. It's all correct. We are moving from what we just heard about to more about what happens uh, kind of behind the scenes and behind every type of production. So we're not, we're moving away from like the content relations, but more about how do we make sure that uh, every film can be made sustainably and how do we make sure that those are strategies that we implement not on a one-to-one -one basis but that we make sure that the whole industry can transition towards sustainable development. I was very uh, humbled when I got asked about uh, you know, giving this talk, especially because of the very important title, you know, Sustainable Managers of the Future, and so I decided to take a few minutes and actually maybe discuss who and what a sustainability manager is, because I think that's uh, still fairly new to most people, and I don't think there's much consensus about this yet. So I decided to go in the very usual, you know, what, who, who, with, where, with, you know, the, the W's, right, the common W's. So first of all, what is a sustainability manager? A uh, sustainability manager is the a new for some, again, person that can be integrated within your crew and can be sort of a production person, of course. I think at least for me, that's that's really crucial. And that can arrange for a, an environmental management system that 
sort of caters to all of the basic needs of every production, but do it in a way that's not going to compromise, uh, you know, the economic, social, and environmental benefits. So when we talk about sustainability, remember that we're always talking about the intersection between people, planet, and profit. So we're trying to plan for something that is going to benefit, benefit all three dimensions, or at least not uh, sort of deplete any of them. And so what we're looking at is, of course, energy, transport, waste, materials, and all of the sort of the very kind of concrete elements. Uh, but then we're also looking at how to share this sort of new working culture within your crew, how to make it also sustainable for them. And so how to integrate the practices, not just within the production department, but in all others, so that the change that we can create is long lasting and can have a domino effect on the professionals that are at play. Um, who is your sustainability manager? Well, hopefully you have a trusted one. Uh, we all know that, of course, a sustainability is a complex uh, matter. So it's, it's always going to take a bit of uh, an adjustment to, to have a new person on set, of course, and also to understand that it's not going to be, you know, a one solution fits all. Uh, not every film set ha will have the same kind of actions that a sustainability manager is going to, to suggest. Each film kind of is different. So a, a big mapping needs to be required. And that's why, in my opinion, when we are asking about who the, uh, the sustainability manager is, it should be a person that has both, of course, knowledge about you know, sustainable uh, development and environmental management practices, but also be a production person. I think that's crucial because, of course, we have very specific hierarchies and kind of structures and needs and, and timings. You know, we are very um, peculiar industry in the way to, that we do things. And so I think it's important to, to match those, those skills. Now, the next uh, question, of course, is, is when. So when do I involve a sustainability manager into my work? Uh, well, my suggestion is do it as early as possible, as soon as possible. I uh, often uh, talk about as of, like as soon as uh, hopefully location scouting. I think when it comes to the bigger measures of impact in our sector, be it so energy, you know, tra transport, like those elements really require a bit of planning. But at the same time, and this is, you know, I think it's very important to, to, to kind of express is that it's not going to be an added layer of complexity, right? If your sustainability manager, you know, works alongside you from the early, early stages, it is actually going to increase the quality of your working time. It's going to help remove some of the burdens. So it's going to both be kind of planning for, for, for better environmental performance, but also allow for less sort of stress, less uh, kind of um, touch and go solutions. It's all going to run a bit smoother. And with that, of course, is going to come happier working days and, and, and overall a better time. Um, where does your sustainability manager fit within the life cycle of your of your film? I think again, as I this is a bit of a, a, a cheating because when when and where here are very similar, but there's a, a small difference. Uh, aside from working with your production, so from as again as early as possible and then up to shooting and then later on for all of the reporting, I think it's it's. Uh, um, important to mention that sustainability managers should also help you in reaching parts of the life cycle that you might not have had a direct connection with before. So we're talking not only about us internally, but about our suppliers and how do we make sure that we bring them along for the, for the change and the transformation. It's about also sometimes bridging the gaps between different productions, right? We often work in silos, so every production has its own little ecosystem. But what if your sustainability manager can maybe uh, create a solution that works for you and for their next project and can bring it to them and kind of lower uh, the cost and, the, and the, the kind of the complexities of logistics. So oftentimes, I talk also with you know the, the 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 suppliers that give us our paint, that give us our wood, that give us all sorts of us material needs, and we try to bring them with us. And so the life cycle kind of 
expands and makes it easier for each individual production to have what they need and have it in a way that's cost effective and time effective because ultimately the the individual pushes of each production are not going to to cut it unless we kind of combine the the demand so that we can get you know enough in in return um the other big thing is then how how do we work how do i work for example uh i work with uh in the, of course at first with the with the production department but then i learn and kind of it's it's an exchange a knowledge exchange between me and then all of the other departments so we go into the needs of the costume department to what they will need to produce into the set designers we are also doing a lot about the biodiversity of your locations about animal welfare remember this is not just again about the the physical assets that you produce but it's about kind of the effect that you that you have also on where you go and shoot on the communities that you go and shoot so usually i try and pull all of the all of these elements together and the 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 cool thing about uh, your sustainability manager is that probably they will have a very holistic view of of what's going on because maybe the departments talk to each other but not too much you know they're all doing their different work but us being in contact with each person you know we, we will have a bit of a like a a bird's view on on, on the big puzzle that it is your production so i always tell producers you know try and capitalize on that try and use that as best as you can because we we we, we might we might be able to to bridge some of the gaps um and so hopefully, finally, uh, if I've made my talk compelling enough, we will already know about the last um, uh, answer about the why. Why would you have a sustainability manager? Uh, again, hopefully you uh, might know uh, right now, but the point is to, of course, try and manage your money your assets your people everything in a way that is going to first of all not cause harm to the environment we all know that we are like a big circus on wheel right as uh, wheels uh, and so we are uh, we're washing and cleaning and producing we're like really going places and then often unfortunately kind of trashing them in our in our way to to narrate the stories that we choose to tell and so it's about kind of rearranging that and bringing a new culture so again that's the long lasting effect even if we close a film set you know tomorrow hopefully the skills of the individual uh, professionals will be brought along and it's about making you know a, a kind of a better experience for everyone and also of course matching the behind the camera with the front of the camera so especially if you have content that's already sensitive and uh, kind of enough to 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 take this into consideration it's only fair that we kind of put the our money where our mouths are and our cameras are in this case and kind of match match the two things. Amazing. Ludovica, thank you so much. That was great. I've got a whole bunch of questions here. Um, but I think we're gonna go with this one, which is as sustainability managers are kind of a relatively new role in, in the world of filmmaking. If people are watching this and they're like, oh, I, I need one of those, but how do I how do I go about finding one? You know, what do they cost? Like, how are they trained? Like, yeah, how do you even begin? If you're if you're new to this and you're thinking, I need one of those for my production, where do you even begin to to start? That's a very good that's a very good question. It's it's the million dollar question, probably, right? Um, so I think when it comes to um, to where do you find them first of all first of all if you want to drop an email to me and then i can probably send you know send you to colleagues around europe or, or the world it's fine we have a uh, it's true we have a bit of a network we have lots of networks you can probably uh, find some online like the global green media network for example we have a few where we're all connected and there's also lots of um talks that are starting to be held at all the different industry events, you know, like Locarno, Venice, Berlin, Cannes, we, we, we're kind of starting to, to move there. So that's one way to look at them. Uh, the other way is, of course, to, to look at training. And training is really crucial and important. It's something that we're also developing at, at Ecomovie. You know, we work mainly in Italy and the south of, of Europe. But we're trying to also construct them with, with, with fellow 
colleagues around Europe because it is really crucial that we have common understanding. So I think go to your institutions also, uh, go to your uh, Europe, you know, creative media desk or to your national or local film commission and they should, they should be able to, to kind of push you in the right direction. Or again, try and come through one of us and we are a very uh, tightly knit group and we can probably send you to the person that's closer to you. I know it's not the most efficient of ways, but we'll have to structure ourselves better. Actually, if anyone in the comments has ideas or the willpower to help us create this uh, better network so that our clients can find us, then yeah. send us an email. Amazing, amazing. We'll be sure to uh, share any contact details, but Ludovica from Eco Movie, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Um, and right now, audience, we are gonna take a break. Um, it's just gone 10.50 and we'd like to begin again at 11 o'clock sharp. Um, so get yourself a cup of tea, go to the loo and we'll be kicking off at 11 again and we'll be going straight into climate storytelling. So please do come back 11 o'clock. You've got eight minutes and we'll see you then. Thanks all.
Hi, everybody, and welcome back to our series of talks this morning about the intersection of the creative industries and the climate crisis. And uh, we have got three more amazing speakers coming up for you this morning, and we're just going to dive straight in. Uh, we're going to begin with storytelling for climate justice with Mimi Thebo. Mimi is Associate Professor of Creative Writing at the University of Bristol and co-founder of the Storytelling for Climate Justice Research Group. She's also a Carnegie long-listed author for young readers and her work has been translated into 12 languages and adapted for a BAFTA winning BBC film. So, so amazing and so happy to welcome Mimi this morning. Mimi, I hand over to you. Everybody, um, thank you so much for coming today. It's been absolutely fascinating. There's an, an ancient Chinese curse that says we, you know, may you live in interesting times, and we're certainly living in interesting times. The question of whether or not we can avoid societal collapse in the face of the upcoming uh, climate collapse is one that I find very interesting. In fact, I find it quite gripping. As a novelist, it certainly informs my storytelling. And as an academic, I want to understand how I can make my storytelling more effective. I'm going to make three uh, basic positions clear to start. Firstly, the collapse of our planet's stable climate systems is now unstoppable. And our efforts towards mitigation of the worst of this collapse have so far been extremely feeble. Secondly, I don't believe in the fairy tale of limitless growth or that tech bros are going to magic us out of any need for fundamental societal change. As Guy Harrington's uh, 2021 update to the 1972 MIT Group of Rome's Limit to Growth paper clearly shows in a peer-reviewed article that has been posted as a resource on the KPMG website, BAU, usual, is going to lead us to utter disaster. Thirdly, I believe that sentience helps drive and accelerate evolution and that humans in particular have the ability to rapidly and effectively adapt and thrive in challenging circumstances. And that story is a vital tool in this process of adaptation. I'm just going to very basically describe how fiction works in the brain. And I'm, I'm talking about literary, reading literary fiction in particular. Although we can extrapolate a great deal of this to other forms of storytelling, including film, gaming, um, and other ways of accessing story. If you're sitting in a chair watching a film about somebody running, your brain thinks you're sitting in a chair watching a film. If you're sitting in a chair reading a book, about somebody running. Your brain thinks you're running. Now, this is really important in a number of ways. But the most vital way, uh, and I, this story, this, this study, I, I feel really bad saying this in front of filmmakers and game set designers. Um, this study was done a few years ago, and I don't think it really takes into account some of the different ways our brains engage with other kinds of storytelling. That said, the way this works in terms of changing um, how we react to stimuli lies in the way uh, the brain actually chooses an action in, in response to stimuli. And we used to think that uh, we would have a situation come at us and we would uh, use our neocortex and very carefully analyze what we would do in reaction to the stimuli. Now, if you've ever gone uh, wrong on your diet or if you've ever um, said something in an argument that you really didn't want to say, you'll know that this, <laughs> this doesn't actually happen in this way. We don't, we don't do that. Instead, what we have are, are we have kind of like action files and they're quite deep in the brain 
um, close to the reptilian uh, cortex that we share with, uh, with lots of life forms. And we select them on the basis that we have done them before and we didn't die. <laughs> so this is not a, very, not a very great way to select our actions, uh, to our responses to stimuli. And the more we select them and the more we don't die doing them, the more they become habits and harder to break. So one way that story works is that it gives us different actions to pull from. Uh, because we do have this override moment in our neocortex when we decide on an action, which is very quick, um, almost involuntary. We decide on this action, we have a moment for override. And if we have other files, other actions that are more successful available to us, there's a chance that we're going to go back and say, no, let's do something different. Right. I just realized in the middle of this wonderful talk that I forgot to tell you what I look like. Um, I'm a 60 year old white woman with white hair and a faded green t-shirt. So stories help give us additional ways of reacting to stimuli. And this creates change, both for the person who had consumed the story and internalized the story because it felt important to them. They liked it, they engaged with it on some really deep level. But also provides a transformative effect to society as the individuals uh, work together in these new ways. Our group looking into this uh, was formed after COP26 made us all feel very hopeless. <laughs> um, it consists of myself. So I'm Dr. Mimi Thibault. I'm head of creative writing at the University of Bristol, and I write about recovery from trauma and uh, the connection, our connection to the natural world. It also has as other members, Dr. Joanna Naden, who is at uh, the University of Bristol academic in creative writing. Um, her latest novel, uh, Day, uh, The uh, Double Life of Daisy Hemmings, was just published by Bloomsbury last this week. She's a former labor speech writer, and she often writes about social justice. At the University of Tasmania is Dr. Lucy Christopher, who is currently advertising a paid PhD for a writer for young people who wants to write about the climate crisis. Lucy often writes about gender roles and social justice. Dr. Ellen Caldicott at the University of Lancaster writes about individuals dealing with societal collapse um, in historical fiction. Professor Richard Pancost is the head of Earth Sciences at the University of Bristol. And Professor Richard Pettigrew from philosophy at the University of Bristol, who's interested in how we change our minds. Richard Pancost sums up the work of the group brilliantly. He wrote and said, I have been increasingly frustrated by the prevailing stories about how we address climate challenges. Too often we invoke heroic or savior narratives rather than stories of collective and community action. Noting that his is primarily a critique of Western narratives. He's interested in how stories create agency, but also how they create the most effective and appropriate agency. There is no doubt as we approach these challenges in the interesting times we live in, that creating effective and appropriate agency, working with communities, working towards concepts of justice are going to be essential if we're going to avoid societal collapse, if we're going to avoid the kind of actions that we've seen in crises like Katrina, Grenfell, Lesvos, and Uvalde. 
Um, so far, the way we've reacted to crisis of, uh, of this kind that's informed by uh, climate change, that's informed by resources for communities has not been brilliant. So we need new stories. We need new stories that are not about a hero or a savior, but are about groups of people working together, overcoming their dis differences to achieve uh, what SW, which in the um, limits to change um, literature is a stable world. Together, we're exploring these topics in our own processes and we're discussing them. You can join us if you like. Um, do just drop me an email and we'll put you on the mailing list. And we're also releasing a survey soon to do with perceived or actual silencing, censoring, self-censoring in writing about climate change for activists, business people, writers, artists, politicians, teachers, and scientists. That's what I've got for you this morning. I'm willing to take questions. Thank you so much, Mimi. And I've got a bunch of questions. So we'll see see how many we can we can squeeze in. Um, really just on a practical note, uh, the group that you were talking about, that group of your, your colleagues and others, um, could you just say the name again? And is there a, a link that we can share out with our-, with our Yeah, audience? it's Storytelling for Climate Justice on Twitter. I think it's, hang on. Then we'll make one, sure we make our, sure our wonderful Emma, Emma Seguin, um, the, the science fiction author and, uh, and uh, climate activist is our administrator. And she set up this wonderful um, hashtag. It's at writing number four future. Okay, at writing for as in the number four future, and we'll put that we'll put that in in the YouTube chat so everyone. I'm can... really easy to find if you just Amazing. Google me. Um, you can get my email. Um, so here was a question that came in, which is somebody saying they love the idea of stories about collective agency versus a single savior complex. Um, are there examples of you know, published works sort of specifically trying to tackle that out in the world, or is it very much this, this still needs to happen, or that, are there lots of things you can point to and go, well, that's a great example, that's a great example? There are some great examples, um, but right now when I think about what's being published for young people in particular, which is my speciality, mm. uh, about... Uh, the challenges it faces, particularly, uh, of course, we write a lot about, and I write a lot about, um, uh, connections to animals. Um, the the number one best-selling book about an animal last year was about a girl who feeds a polar bear on peanut butter, doesn't die, rides on the polar bear's back, and saves the polar bear. I think we've got a way to go before we start <laughs> making stories. And of course, you know, all over the world, we're teaching um, Joe Campbell and the hero's journey. And um, yeah, there are examples, there are, but right now we are kind of overwhelmed by the hero. Um, and then a very big question for a very small amount of time and <laughs> the minute we've got left, which is, there seems to be a sort of a constant back and forth about how you tell these stories of, you know, and you were talking about climate collapse and, you know, collapse is obviously yeah. you know, very, um, and the idea of hope versus fear and what people engage with and what turns people off. Is it just a constant dance between those things or is there I think yeah. you know I spent I spent a good portion of my life riding my bike and weeding my own yogurt and thinking that I could individualize my way out of climate crisis which was my generation's way of being incredibly stupid about these issues um, I think we can see by what's going on with our governments. I'm American and uh, British, I have dual nationality, and, and I'm messed up in both countries. Um, 
So I think we can see that our governments have very little power against the economic interests that are, are, are pushing us towards climate collapse. So although there are, you know, individual things that we can do in terms of, you know, rebelling and making uh, small changes and trying to do our best, it's kind of a rehearsal for what we'll need to do when we have uh, more individual power. I think that what, what we need to do is make systems that give us hope. We have to construct our hope. Nobody's going to do it for us. And so every time you mend something and you don't buy it and you don't give people money, that's, that's a, re a rebellion and it's a start for the kinds of skills that we need. Every time you overlook something that somebody's done or said that's irritated you and find a way to work with other people, that's, that's a rebellion and those are the skills we need. So yes, I think there's a lot of hope, um, but the, the, it won't be given to us. We're going to have to manufacture it ourselves. Amazing. Mimi, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We'll put all of the links to your work into the chat so everyone can access please, that. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you again. And without further ado, I'm on standby. Roy, you've muted yourself. Oh, sorry, I just realized I was completely muted. Sorry, I'll do that again. Um, so next up, Jessica Edwards talking about transformative storytelling. Uh, she is Director of Impact and Partnerships for Doc Society and has a long and rich background in documentary and factual television, producing strategic communications. Um, also has been an impact strategist on award-winning films, including Unrest, He Named Me Malala and Ida's Diary. So without further ado, Jessica, can I hand over to you? Thanks, Roy. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here this morning. Um, I just want to acknowledge and thank all the other speakers this morning for the brilliant work that they're doing. And I hope that um, this short little kind of presentation will build on that and hope you know, I hope it will inspire you. So my name is Jessica Edwards. Um, I'm a white woman with tied back dark hair. Um, I've got hoop earrings and I'm wearing a grey top. Um, so I'm here really briefly to talk about climate storytelling, because in my role at Doc Society, uh, which is an international nonprofit which uplifts great uh, documentary films and connects them to audiences globally, um, I work on the Climate Story Fund, um, which supports compelling storytelling and impact campaigns from around the world that move us closer to a climate just and biodiverse future. So um, my plan is to inspire you with some transformative climate storytelling projects and then to whiz through some pointers of where to go to ensure your stories are going to make a difference. And if there's time, I'll try and answer some questions that Roy will help filter at the end of this. Um, so let's try that. So why climate storytelling? Um, so really, we at Doc Society have committed to uplifting climate storytelling because Six out of 10 people from countries and territories around the world surveyed by the Yale Programme on Climate Change Communication found that they wanted more information about climate change, but with more than a billion adults knowing very little about the biggest existential crisis facing humanity, raising awareness amongst the public about climate change is critical, and we need all sorts of tools and resources to do that. Um, so, you know, climate reports have been published with some really devastating information but as the outcomes of the recent COP26 have demonstrated there's still a lack of global political will for bold action at the pace and scale that's needed to address the climate crisis and impactful climate communication of all sorts is more critical than ever um, and as cultural creators we can take action in our own ways, as Tay was talking about earlier, by unleashing brilliant creative storytelling to meaningfully connect with more communities um, and to create stories that challenge and inspire audiences to hold leaders 
to account. So I'm just going to do a quick screen share um, and share some slides. OK, here we go. Right. OK, so as writer Amitav Ghosh says, when future generations look back, they will certainly blame the leaders and politicians of this time for their failure to address the climate crisis. But they may well hold artists and writers to be equally culpable, for the imagining of possibilities is not, after all, the job of politicians and bureaucrats. And he wrote this in his book, The Great Derangement, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, and this is the reason why Doc Society is supporting a range of climate stories from around the world, challenging ourselves to move past a monoculture of past climate narratives and to identify and amplify a biodiversity of stories as diverse as the ecosystems we seek to save. And we want to inspire and encourage other storytellers from around the world and different places to also kind of embrace the opportunities and the creative possibilities with climate storytelling too. So these transformative stories that we're supporting include Chi Tai's beautiful animation of Nicola Davies' children book, children's book, The Promise, Andrea Arnold's film Cow, about the life of Luna, a female dairy cow, which is available on Mubi. Um, or The People versus Climate Change, which is about the UK's Citizens' Assembly on Climate, which you can watch on BBC iPlayer. Or Rebellion, about the inner workings of Extinction Rebellion, which has recently been released on Netflix. Or even the forthcoming film The Territory, which is about the tireless fight of the Awawao tribe in the Brazilian Amazon against encroaching deforestation, which is going to be shown in cinemas from September um, and will be launched on Nat Geo and Disney Plus later in the year. And last but not least, Weira, a wild and amazing and innovative film that's just had its world premiere at the Frameline Festival in San Francisco and has an extraordinary journey ahead of it. So I'm going to just share a brief show reel to kind of give you a sense and a feel of some of the projects um, from a visual and kind of audio visual sense. So Danny, would you mind playing the reel? Just a report from these white climate crisis rooms, what they worry about. Straws, sea turtles, black people. <laughs> it's not a good order. Fashion floats between being the second and third most destructive industry on the planet. I had this vision of making one collection that was completely sustainable from start to finish. I understood the promise I had made. I held a forest in my arms. No país hoje existem alguns movimentos pioneiros que vivem outras performatividades de drag, outros jeitos de ser drag, que não são os jeitos tradicionais. Um grupo que decide questionar não apenas gênero, sabe, mas também questões sociais e ambientais. Somos atravessadas por sermos indígenas. LGBTs. Como lo defendemos con organización, con lucha, con reflexiones, con pensarnos una una transformación y sobre todo con todas las acciones que tienen que ver pero en colectivo. My friends died doing this. There is a spirit that tells me we have to do it because nobody else will. XR is incredibly important to me. It pushed people. And those people who were pushed towards showing up had such a like effect on this country. Like nothing like that has happened in years. Climate change is a long-term issue. We've got to conduct ourselves in a way which is sustainable instead of this Catherine wheel of emotions. A new report.
report from the CDC says suicide rates among American farmers is higher than any other occupational group. America's heartland, meanwhile, in distress. Tough times getting tougher. The Wall Street Journal this morning, farmers are filing for bankruptcy at the highest level in at least a decade. Register. I'm sure kinakaba ng mga baklangan nun. <laughs> Gusto mo bang malaman ang dito ng lugar na to? Alam mo bang ninakaw ang lugar na to sa mga tao? Noong Yolanda, nung ilan nga, nakasabi ko kagabi sa pagtulog. Ako! <laughs> Siyempre po, nandito kami ngayon para po magbahagi ng kasiyahan sa inyo. La crisis climática que estamos viviendo es un tema de interdependencia completamente que va más allá de de cómo se organiza un gobierno, ¿no? Este son, es más grande. Lo que está pasando con el agua, con el aire y con este virus es que te dice, por si no te acordabas, tú también eres ecosistema y estás correlacionado. Parece como algo eh, obvio y básico, pero organizarse es juntarse de nuevo y ver qué vamos a hacer. When I opened the envelope, read the information, I thought it might have been a hoax, because I thought, who's going to write to me from the House of Commons? You could be one of over 100 people selected to take part in the UK-wide Citizens' Assembly. On how should the UK tackle climate change? See you later. Bye. Seven. What do I know about climate change? Not a lot. Okay. So as you can see, these are all stories that have got fantastic creative potential, but also they critically have fantastic impact potential too. Um, and what I mean by that is that the creative teams behind these projects are not only working on creating these stories, but they're also working out plans for how to get them out into the world and thinking really carefully about who the audience is um, that the, these projects are most going to resonate with, both the communities that are centered in the stories and how to connect the stories to the, those communities, but also the strategic audiences who most need to hear these stories the most. Um, and how importantly, these projects might help inspire some kind of change. So I'm just gonna go back to my slides. And when I say that, what I mean is, you know, maybe the audience for some of these projects could be political leaders at the UN General Assembly, or they could be students watching online in their bedrooms at home, or it could be refugees in Kakuma or Zatari in Jordan in refugee camps at the front line of the climate crisis. Because whilst having a brilliant and beautiful story is a powerful thing, ensuring that it's being seen by the audience, it's really gonna resonate with, is the key to transformative climate storytelling. And that is where the real change can take place. So all the brilliant stories I've just mentioned um, have been working really hard on their engagement plans. Um, and let me share with you some pointers of some great resources um, that these teams are using that may help you think about how to catalyze your climate storytelling, um, to think about not just how you're telling climate stories, but also to think more about who you're telling them to and what sort of change could take place. So first up, there's Britain Talks Climate, a brilliant insight into British attitudes to climate and the seven different audience groups um, they've identified. It's been a total inspiration to all manner of British climate stories since its release in October, 2020. There's also On Road Media's Six Ways to Change Hearts and Minds About Climate, which is about how to frame climate change and improve understanding and inspire action. And I should just say that hopefully these links will appear in the chat. Um, there's also the Climate Story Lab Toolbox, um, which is an asset packed resource designed for cultural organisers who want to hold their own Climate Story Lab. And there's videos and text and slides and resources that help organisers create an event about climate storytelling that is free um, to access and available for anyone to use. Um, and last but not least is also Doc Society's Impact Field Guide, which is a free online resource. It's now available in seven different languages and it's all about how to make impact with film and storytelling. 
Um, and as you can see, it's got case studies, it's got tools, it's got frameworks, all sorts of really juicy um, information and uh, assets that can help you help your films have more impact and be ultimately more transformative. So if you're on a journey with climate storytelling, the possibilities are there to be reimagined, both creatively, but also strategically. And that's the true path to transformative storytelling. Ultimately, there's not a moment to waste. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was, that was amazing. Um, we are bang on 11.30, but I do want to squeeze in one just really, really, really quick question which um, does um, the work you're doing, is it fun to support um, fiction projects? Is it all about documentaries? Um, is, there, is there funding available for kind of the fictional side of things as well? Is that a space that's sort of active? Uh, so we've got 28 projects on the slate. They're a mix. We've got some documentaries, got short form, we've got podcasts. They do skew nonfiction. Um, and but we have always said that we would support fiction, but only um, from an impact perspective as opposed to production. So it's not production funding for fiction. But if you've got a, a film that needs to go out into the world, we're really happy to kind of we're really interested, actually, to support that journey to accelerate its transformative potential. Amazing. Thank you so much. We'll put all the links that you were referencing in the in the chat so people can access that and also access the work you're doing. But thank you so much for joining us this morning, Jessica. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, and we are going to swiftly move straight to our final speaker this morning, uh, Josh Co Cockcroft, um, who's Director of Climate Spring, a development fund for film and TV projects about climate change. Um, Josh, if I can just hand over to you. Thank you, Roy. Much appreciated. Uh, so I'm Josh, uh, I'm 32 years old from British and Zanzibar heritage, uh, I've got long dark hair, uh, a bit of a beard, glasses, and I'm wearing a brown uh, kurta, which is a kind of, uh, kind of shirt. So uh, as Roy said, I'm also director of Climate Spring, uh, which is a new organisation only set up this year that funds and supports, um, that funds and supports the development of stories about the climate crisis for film and TV. Um, so I have to take questions about that later. First of all, thank you very much to everyone who contributed to the event this morning, and I'm kind of hoping to build on what's gone before. To start with, uh, I want to take us back about 70 years um, to 1948. And 1948 was an interesting time. There was a lot of drilling still going on in the US, and Standard Oil was the big company, if not the biggest, or perhaps even the biggest company in the world. And they were about, they just discovered, uh, they were about to try and start drilling in Louisiana, uh, in Bayou country. But they were starting to get some early pushback. There was a concern increasingly at this stage that drilling oil rigs might possibly harm the kind of beautiful natural aspect of the environment. And the Bayou County in Louisiana, where a lot of the oil was, was particularly beautiful. So they decided, well, okay, what can we do here? And so they commissioned a film. They commissioned a film called Louisa, The Louisiana Story, which was a story about um, Alexandre Neop uh, Napoleon Ulysses Latour, a young Bayou boy and his pet raccoon, and the story about what happens to him and his family uh, when, uh, when they start drilling for oil in Louisiana. The film is directed in um, the film is presented as a documentary, but is actually scripted and is directed by one of the many, many dubious characters of 20th century filmmaking, a guy called Robert Flaherty, who also made a film about seal hunters in Northwood and Nanny Cooper North, um, and who's worth looking up and is not the most kosher individual. But the film, which is a feature length film, which uh, the link we shared with you in the chat, uh, won an Oscar and a Pulitzer Prize, and is it a great job? It was a wonderful um, moment for Standard Oil and for the company, and put aside a lot of the fears about how drilling, but basically put, put forward this idea that drilling could work beautifully with the natural environment. This was in some ways, the starting gun for the oil industry's 70 year campaign to harness culture for their own ends. Uh, the oil industry has kind of known this, it has since then kind of been doubling down on this approach. They've been trying to find many different ways to kind of dominate the narrative. 
And the fact is that climate change has become a cultural battleground. And very much for the last century, the fossil fuel companies have been winning the war. They know the value of information and of culture, and they've been working really, really hard to control the narrative. Um, from the 1960s, you, you have Exxon with the you know, doing a lot of climate change research, realizing this is absolutely something that was going to happen, but investing in and, uh, and several investing in proofing themselves and their oil rigs against rising sea levels and the like, while simultaneously investing in extensive disinformation campaigns to question the science behind it and to really kind of so, so discount. Um, so discord among the scientists that no consensus can be built. I get asked sometimes uh, whether culture is important in the climate crisis, uh, but surely there, are, surely there are other priorities. But the fact is that we have a lot of the science, a lot of the tools, even a lot of the technology, but what we don't really have is the willingness to make the difficult decisions and to change society in order to save ourselves. And that's where stories come in. Stories have an enormous power to change how you think. In the 1980s, Cheers made designated drivers happen to stop drunk driving. In the 90s, Spike Lee made us talk about race. Uh, some of it has been slightly less kosher, but others, you know, they obviously made sort of smoker happen. The adventure of Marlboro cigarettes came to fall with the kind of John Wayne era of filmmaking. And creators often tell ourselves that we have the power to change people's minds. And a lot of the time, this is kind of often just a bit of a hopeful statement, possibly to, possibly to win a grant. Um, but there is actual, very, genuine peer-reviewed science, neuroscience no less, on just how this works. When you read or listen or watch characters that you connect with, going about their day, overcoming challenges, saving the world in some shape or form, you undergo a process called narrative transportation. And in the same way, you're more likely to believe someone that you love when they tell you that, honest to God, they're not running a Ponzi scheme. You're much more likely to listen to them than someone that you dislike or feel nothing about. And you're more likely to take on views of your favorite character. When you're being narratively transported, you take in information fundamentally differently than when you're presented with a selection of facts. For a narrative, you're less able to critically engage, less able to stick to your entrenched viewpoint. Fundamentally, story has the power to get you to change your mind. And that's the power of story, for good or for bad, anyone can use it. Research has demonstrated that a single story has the power to change someone's behavior up to three months afterwards, and much more so indefinitely, even if reinforced with similar messaging. People will change their behavior to act in ways which are consistent with the ideas they absorb from the story. And that is the enormous power that a story can have in you. Fossil fuel companies aren't the only ones who know this. They use it extremely effectively and have enormous budgets to be able to do this through a variety of mediums. Um, but as I say, the tobacco industry, the arms industry, think of Top Gun, um, the anti-smoking lobby, drink driving campaigners, they've all made use of the power of stories over time. The problem is we're at a crucial junction in the climate crisis and the fossil fuel industries are still owning the narrative. There's still a view that climate change and being concerned about climate change is still a niche attitude. Uh, and that's something we need to change and normalize. But we can access the same weapons they can. We can access stories, we can tell it, we can make, we can tell a great tale. And we can use those stories to take back control, change us as a civilization and change our course. We have the technology, we have the know-how, we have the tools. It's now up to creators everywhere to change the culture, take back the narrative and empower societies to save ourselves. Thank you for listening and happy to take any questions on that or on climate spring. Amazing. Thank you so much, Josh. Um, yeah, got a couple of questions, so hopefully we can squeeze, squeeze them all in. Um, climate Spring, can you tell us just a little bit more about that work and what kind of projects you're either looking to work on or looking to collaborate on? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, climate, uh, climate Spring is a relatively new organisation. So we're only going for about six months. We effectively do three things. We provide early stage finance for the development of creative projects with scripted long form TV and film uh, from agented writers or, or writers with track record. Unfortunately, due to the conservative nature of the industry and the fact that with, there is this lack of stories in the, in, the, in the space, if you look at TV and film, it's as if we're living in some sort of tangent universe where climate change just doesn't happen. We're having to take a fairly risk averse approach to the kind of talent we're working with. But, um, and in terms of the stories we're looking for, 
we want to we want stories that will positively engage people with climate change so we're not looking for dystopian horrors about how we're going to die horribly and london's going to be sinking underwater and that's the end of time um we're looking for things that can encourage people to think to think about the world differently or about changing their minds or about how or about what can be done to change the world those are the kind of things we're looking for and um if people do have those stories and are looking to get funding is it the kind of thing where people are like is the the model that people would come and apply to you or just get in contact with you what's the, what's yeah, the you can get in contact with us via the website um which i will share in the chat um and it can so looking forward to hearing from you amazing um the other question that um, came up was, you know, you're talking about almost the, the kind of war between the narratives of kind of, you know, the fossil fuel companies, you know, throwing everything they've got at it. And you were saying that's still, you know, they're still winning that war. If that's how we're going to frame it. In your mind, is that just down to, is it a money game or they've just got like way more resource and they've just got that? Is it the fact that that's the culture that's been established for the last, you know, post-war society or whatever it might be or is it something more than just about who's throwing the most funding at it i mean money inevitably helps i mean like hiring a tank is really expensive so if, it's, if someone can give you that for free that's really useful um but i think the fact is that we've been we're the content that's been created today created by people who are living in the post-war world which has been created by the fossil fuel industries we're now at a point where we're trying to change that and it takes a bit of a cognitive step to be able to understand how the world we're in the co and the culture and what you're seeing on screen has been formed by that and I think we're at a stage where we need to be able to see kind of understand what the new what how what are reimagining a future and what the stories might be like which is not the easiest thing to do in the world it's kind of imagining the imagining another possibility is always a very difficult thing to do but it's certainly but it's certainly doable and I think that money inevitably does help and you can go a long way but the fact is and this is kind of the flip side of the film and tv film and tv is a business it's a commercial enterprise and people and the people in control will make content that makes them money so if the, so if there is a there is an obviously a general shift at the moment towards kind of being more climate conscious and kind of awareness of that people are more interested in this content but there isn't enough of it yet there isn't enough in the culture there isn't enough about showing positive changes so here's our window, here's our opportunity where there should be a market ready for it, but there aren't people making this as yet. So we need to kind of push that forward. Don't Look Up, which I'm sure many of you have seen at Christmas, was kind of like an interesting example and at least proved that there is a commercial basis for this. And so money does help because it means you can just, you know, make a film like the Uzan story and not really care whether you're going to make any money or not. So we need to be a bit smarter than that and tell a really compelling story. But that also works in our favour. And if you can get 500 eyeballs or 500 million eyeballs on it, A, you're going to make yourself a bag of cash. And secondly, you can help change the world. Right. And it was so interesting. You, you mentioned um, Top Gun Maverick, which obviously I, yeah, I was one of the many people who went, went along to see it and had a, had a great time watching it, even though like while you're in it, you know, like I know I've been telling all these, like I've been told these stories about American military might and like, and you can't help but just get swept up in a good story. Okay. Right, and after just like, go America, absolutely. Yeah. It's kind of like, you know, these are the good guys, absolutely. Tom Cruise is on side. Everything must be absolutely fine. And yeah. that's the power of it. It's remarkable. Yeah, that is the power of story. Josh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we will share the Climate Spring details in the chat. And if that sounds like something you're interested in, please do make contact. But thank you again, Josh, for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Um, that was our final speaker. Um, what a morning uh, we've had. Thank you so much to all of our speakers who have been absolutely brilliant. Um, I think it's given us just a huge perspective on the range of different ways of engaging with narrative, um, down to the practical steps you can take when you're trying to produce a piece of you know, a, a, a creative piece, whether that's having a sustainability manager or thinking about it in terms of a climate action toolkit, all those different stages reflect the complexity of what we're trying to deal with. And yet, as Mimi says, there is hope and there is space for these stories. So I hope those tuning in have taken something positive, hopeful away from um, everything that's been talked about this morning. 
Um, just a couple of things before we go, a couple of housekeeping matters. Um, one is just to flag um, more imagining possibilities. Uh, workshops are happening on the 19th of July. Um, you can look that up at the watershed, but carrying on these conversations about imagining different ways of being and different ways of doing. And just really quickly, um, anyone who signed up to this talk this morning, you will get a survey by email and it'd be amazing to have your feedback because that allows the watershed to make things better and to also keep doing and expanding what they're doing. But that is everything this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. Hope it's been useful. Hope it's been inspiring. And we will see you again very soon. Thanks a lot, everyone. Bye.